I don't know about you, but I often get in my own way. Well, today we're going to talk about how to get yourself out of your own way so you can get to where you want to go. Stay tuned. This episode of Keeping It Real is brought to you by Real Geeks. How many homes are you going to sell this year? Do you have the right tools? Is your website turning soft leads into interested buyers? Are you spending money on leads that aren't converting? Well, Real Geeks is your solution. Find out why agents across the country choose Real Geeks as their technology partner. Real Geeks was created by an agent for agents. They pride themselves on delivering a sales and marketing solution so that you can easily generate more business. Their agent websites are fast and built for lead conversion version with a smooth search experience for your visitors. Real Geeks also includes an easy to use agent CRM. So once a lead signs up on your website, you can track their interest and have great follow-up conversations. Real Geeks is loaded with a ton of marketing tools to nurture your leads and increase brand awareness. Visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod and find out why realtors come to Real Geeks to generate more business. Again, visit realgeeks.com forward slash keeping it real pod. And now, on to our show. Hey, podcast listeners, are you trying to figure out how you can actively prospect on Instagram to grow and expand your existing community without feeling like you need more followers or more people in your database? Well, Michelle Berman Michael, who I've interviewed on this show, has not only given hope to those who feel overwhelmed by Instagram, but has also created a strategy that will teach you how to create killer content without needing a videographer, how to prospect using Instagram in minutes, not hours, and how to get more or engagement without posting every day. Now, this program is called Beyond the Method, and it will show you exactly how to master Instagram so that you can generate more real estate business. Keeping it real, podcast listeners get a 10% discount on the program, but only if you visit igcourse.com. That's igcourse.com. And now, on to our show. Welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I'm your guide and host through the show. And in just a moment, we're going to be speaking with Chris King. Before we get to Chris, just a few quick reminders. If you're new to our show, we appreciate you checking us out. And the best way that you can help us continue to grow is by telling another realtor about this show. So think of another agent in your office that is struggling right now and would love to hear from top producers and shoot them a link over to either our website, which is keepingitrealpod.com. They can stream every episode right from a browser. Or if they're a podcast listener, just pull up any podcast app, search for Keeping It Real, and hit that subscribe button. Also, please check out our sponsors. We love our sponsors. They are amazing, and they help keep the whole ship afloat. So check out our sponsors, and we appreciate you telling a friend. All right, let's get to the main event, my conversation with Chris King. Today on the show, our guest is Chris King of Status Flow. Let me tell you more about Chris. Now, I want you to meet the witch doctor, Chris M. King. He drew upon spiritual psychology and insight from diverse luminaries. Chris facilitates transformative expeditions for individuals and organizations, pushing them beyond perceived limits to achieve the seemingly impossible. Choosing an audacious path, Chris built a successful company from the trunk of his car because he didn't have a garage. Chris elevates real estate professionals in achieving what he calls authentic success. He has addressed real estate teams from ballrooms to boardrooms to living rooms, getting them to think differently and succeed in even the most challenging markets, including now. While it may seem like magic, Chris employs science-based tools to align teams with seemingly impossible goals. When teams need more than tools and strategies from just another real estate trainer or coach, they call Chris. I want everybody to do two things. 
first, I want you to subscribe to Chris's podcast called Mindfuck. Uh, it's available anywhere podcasts are served. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. And also visit his website because at the end of this, you are likely going to want to reach out to him for some coaching opportunities. That website is statusflow.net. There will be a link to that also in the show notes. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I love talking to coaches because at the very least, um, obviously it, it can help our listeners. Maybe you get unstuck. Every, I think everyone in the real estate industry maybe is feeling a little bit stuck right now. And also it helps me get unstuck. So this is a, a, a this is a great opportunity for me uh, to get a little um, sort of coaching by osmosis. So I'm excited to do, to talk to you about this, but how did you, how'd you get into coaching? I, I was going to say, we can run a process right now if you want to, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. All right. I, uh, I, I got into coaching because I, my, I had an opportunity. A guy wanted to hire me to become a commercial real estate broker. And, and I said no to him, which was kind of a stupid move in the moment, or at least looked like one, because at that moment I was broke. I had no, no place to live. I was living out of my car quite literally. And so, um, but I, I knew that while, while that direction could have provided me a really good life, there was something else just burning inside me that, that I could show up and serve in a bigger way, in a, in a more authentic way. And, um, and I just had to kind of jump off the cliff and, and hope I could build the plane on the way down, you know? Yeah. Well, how did you get started in coaching? What was, what was, how did you move from the car to, you know, beyond that? Yeah. I mean, how that started was, um, I mean, I was good at it. That was the first thing I, I had, I had done a lot of work. Um, you know, I went to, I, I went to what I lovingly refer to as hippie school, right? I did an education in spiritual psychology. And so that, that provided me a lot of tools and groundwork, but even growing up, I was the guy that all my friends came to with all of their problems. I was sort of like the therapist in the group. Um, and so this has sort of been a lifelong thing. Um, my father's done a lot of mentoring in his life as well. And so I don't know, maybe there's an inherited trait there, but it, um, I, I started because I knew I could do it. It was one of those, yes, I understand I have no proof and I still know I can do this. And so it ultimately was a choice, you know, I just you bet on yourself. Excited. Yeah. That of all the stupid bets I've ever made, the best <laughs> ones turned out to be on me. You know? <laughs> Is it, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think about that a lot myself because I've, I've played some bets on myself and I don't, I don't know that those bets have ever not paid off, quite honestly. I, I've made other bets in my life that weren't about me that I've <laughs> lost, um, you know, with friends and, and whatever. But but certainly, I think there's something about intuition that maybe in our Western world, we don't, you know, talk as much about as, as, as other places. But certainly, there's some inherent wisdom within that I believe you know, we can access, um, through mm -hmm. various different channels. And a lot of times that wisdom can help guide us into our next action or our next career. Obviously, you know, you had that within you as well. Um, but I would like to tell us a little bit about how you approach coaching. Well, there's a difference between coaching and consulting, right? Um, consultants have answers. Coaches have questions because coaching is all about eliciting insight. To your point a moment ago, you have every answer to every question you're ever gonna have, you know, professional, personal, whatever, everything you need is in there somewhere. Yeah. So, and, and this is true of everybody. And so if somebody says, I don't know what to do, what I hear is, I don't have access to my inner knowing. Yeah. So I don't have to figure out the answer. I don't have to look for the answer. It's already in there. What I gotta figure out is what's the barrier that's stopping them. How do I remove that barrier? And then how do I realign them based on what they find so they can relate to it in a way that, that gets them what they want? So, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we do have a science-backed approach. So it's, you know, sometimes I, while, while I can speak, you know, the spiritual psychology thing, I can get very woo or my father, the electromagnetic compatibility engineer, we can talk science. So with, which road do you want to run this down? I'm good. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's interesting. So I've been studying uh, DBT, dialectic behavior therapy for, yeah. for several years, and that is such a cool science-based mm -hmm. approach to reducing activation or reducing mm -hmm. uh, arousal because the science is really clear that when we're in this fight or flight response, which is what happens sometimes with really intense stimulation, 
Um, it, it, it limits access to certain parts of our brain. We just literally don't have access to, because we are in a survival mode and, you know, based on evolutionary psychology and, and, and biology, we, we are, we need to survive in those moments. So, uh, lots of non-essential services like our sexuality, certain parts of our brain have to shut down because if we're being chased by a tiger, we got to continue to run as fast as possible. We need all of that energy to in order in order to survive. And a lot of that happens even today. We get freaked out, we get stressed, we see something on the news, and it, it activates us. And we we are in fight or flight. We might not even realize it, and all of a sudden we're a bit disconnected, right, from our our, mm -hmm. our bodies. So I'm curious to talk about what what are some of these blocks that people have that uh, you know inhibit their ability to access some of this information. Well, there, there, there are psychological blocks and there are physiological blocks. Um, so the, the psychological blocks are going to be the things that I think a lot of people know about, you know, it's the imposter syndrome. It's the, it's, it's the shutdown mechanism of, I don't know, it's fear based, it's shame based. It's whatever. There's, there's a lot of the psychology. Um, the, the physiological blocks are going to be how you relate to things as they show up. You mentioned the news, right? I was in broadcasting for a number of years and I will tell you that the news is not designed to inform you. It's designed to affect you. Right. And they do it very well through the lenses of psychology and neurobiology. They understand how this works. I mean, I used to program people all the time on the radio. Now I just do it differently. <laughs> um, but when you understand what's happening in your physiology, then you can start to sort of hack the system, right? Everything is a system, a business, a team, a human being is a system. And any system can be hacked if you understand how that system works and what's going on. And again, to your point, it requires conscious awareness, right? You got to yeah. know what's going on um, because the the part of your brain that's in charge in the flight or flight is, is when you see something scary on the news, it's the same part of the brain that processes you being chased by a bear. It's just that's it's the same part of the brain. So you got to understand what's going on in your system and recalibrate it to a, the outcome that you're looking for. Yeah. So in DBT, there's a tech, a term called wise mind. And the idea mm -hmm. is when we're aroused, when we're activated, we really don't typically have as much access to wise mind, which the opposite mm -hmm. of that they call is emotion mind. Emotion mind is, oh my God, let's, let's get this figured out right now. Let's, um, let, let's just survive. And it's, mm -hmm. it's typically not super rational when we're in emotion mind, we are just having an experience and all of these things are happening at the same time. And it's not a particularly great place to actually think critically critically or make, you know, any important decisions. So what I love about DBT is, is, is reducing our activation so that we can get access to that wise mind, which again, to your point is that inner wisdom that really does know what is best for us. So, um, let's, let's talk about some of these blocks that, that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, well, first of all, you've mentioned in, in the psychological blocks, imposter syndrome. I love this one because I'm pretty confident that everybody's got this to a certain degree. It's a super common one. And what do you tell people or how do you coach or work with people who, who do say, you know, gosh, I really feel like a fraud. If people only knew how little I really knew about this job or, or whatever, what, what would you say to them or how would you, or, or what would you ask them in order to get them past some of that imposter? Yeah, it's, um, this is going to vary. You know, I'm going to sound like an attorney here. It depends, right? Sure. <laughs> That's going to be the answer to most questions. Um, so because it, it does depend on how somebody is relating to that. Generally, there are some things that you can do. Um, Carlos Castaneda said, we make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. Yeah. And, and I kind of combine that with, a, with something that one of my teachers said to me. is like, Chris, if you're going to tell a story, it might as well be a good one. So you can tell yourself the story that you're not good enough, that you, here's all the, and you can validate that story. Or you can tell yourself, well, wait a minute, I am good enough and I know this. And, and this is not a fake it till you make it thing. Like affirmations, fake it till you make it. This is kind of bullshit. It just sets off my internal bullshit detector. So if right. it works for you, great, but it doesn't work for me. So what I can do is I'll say, okay, is there any evidence that I can point to in my history that might suggest that I am in fact capable of doing this. And when I start looking for those data points and choosing to see them, I'm going to find them all over the place because they're just there. They just are right. So that's, that's the first thing is whatever the thing is you're saying you're not good enough about what if you're wrong and are there any data points you can point to that suggest that maybe that's correct, that you are wrong about this.
Yeah. And when you ask yourself a question like that, you're presupposing there's an answer and your brain starts to look for it, right? So if I say, why do I feel like such a failure in my life? Oh, I've got a litany of of things I can list because here's all the ways in which I failed in life. And if I said Mm -hmm. to myself, and again, it's the same amount of work. Like you said, if I ask, uh, you know, prove to myself I'm a failure. I can do that. <laughs> prove to myself I'm a success. I can do that. It's really the same amount of work. It's it's about asking those questions. Like you said, is there any mm-hmm. evidence to suggest that I've had a little bit of success in this particular area? Um, mm-hmm. And and looking for those reasons to stack those positives. Right, right. I mean, there. I mean, there are a lot of roads that you can take to get there. Like people say, okay, I'm a failure. I feel like a failure. Okay, let's redefine failure. What? How do you define failure? Right. I mean, this is going to be in a very fixed mindset, success or fail. You achieved it or you didn't. And it's like, look, there is no failure. You're either winning or learning. Right. You're either nobody learned anything by doing it right. That's right. You're either winning or learning. So you didn't fail. And and here's the other thing. And this is something that I that I hold on to. I I can't fail because I don't quit. Like I have no quit in me, like none. It's it serves me great in entrepreneurship, it's not so good in romantic partnership because sometimes there's a time to quit, man. Um, <laughs> but um, but if you don't quit, you cannot fail because the game never ends. Right. That's a really powerful thing you just said. I, it's this idea of, and I want to just unpack it a little bit for anyone who, because Chris said it very elegantly and he said it quickly, but he said it, it's what he said is very profound. Go back and, and rewind about 30 seconds. Yeah, wait, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Chris Chris was basically saying, look, the only way we can ever learn something new is through failure. And he's absolutely 100% right, right? You don't learn by doing something right. All that you do when you can do something um, right is confirm that you already know how to do it, right? Which is great. That's good. But in order to learn something new, there's failure in, involved in it. And, that's, and failure, again, is just idea didn't get the result I wanted. And now I can make an adjustment to maybe get myself closer to that end result. And the other thing too, I I think is really important to mention. And and again, this is just my own sort of thought. And Chris, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but it's been my experience. And I would love to say that this isn't true, but I think it is true that the people who are the most successful typically are the ones that fail the most and just keep going. Like to your point, they, they fail a ton and they keep going and they keep getting back up. And there's the, the, the body and the brain is so resilient. We don't give ourselves enough credit. Now failure is hard. It's painful. It sucks. And your body and brain can help you get past it and keep moving. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about failure. Again, failure with the context of why I didn't get the result I wanted and, um, and just, you know, deciding either to quit or to keep going. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I love that quote, you know, it's like, I didn't fail. I just found a thousand ways that it didn't work, you know, yeah. right? <laughs> so yeah. it, it is how you relate to it. Cause here's the science part of this. Okay. When you get into that contraction, right. Of, oh, I failed and the shutdown and I can't and whatever you're driving a neurochemical cocktail that is shutting off certain parts of the brain. And it's the parts of the brain that you need in order to succeed. So it becomes, there's a level of responsibility here. Um, Whatever you're trying to achieve in this in this life, um, small or large, there is no good or bad. There is no right or wrong. There is aligned or misaligned with the outcome that you're looking for. So is thinking, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. I'm stupid. I failed. Is that aligned or misaligned? Obviously misaligned, right? So it's like you have a responsibility here. If you are to be a good steward, of the thing that you're trying to achieve, accomplish, or bring into this world, if you're to be a good steward of that mission, you have the responsibility of doing everything that is aligned with that, including taking control of your thoughts. Because when you stop listening to yourself and you start talking to yourself, the script changes. That's a very profound thought. So so I just want to make sure I understand. So when we stop listening, we may be listening to old programming that was installed by mom and dad unintentionally or the teacher that yelled at us or the bully in the playground or whatever is telling us our story of why we're not enough or why we're less than or, or whatever. Um, 
those could be just programs that got installed somehow and they're still there. We're listening to those stories maybe even today. Everyone's got stories that that do not serve them. When we mm-hmm. start talking to ourselves, we it sounds like we're really creating a new narrative, a new story, and that eventually if we have enough uh, sort of energy behind that, that new story becomes – our our past history at some point because it, it's the beginning of that change. Do I have that right? Yeah, I mean, and and it's not difficult to do once you notice you're in a negative self talk spin, right? That's when you have the opportunity to start talking to yourself because when you're when you're in that negative spin, you're listening to all the noise. You suck. I suck. I'm material. I'm never going to mount to anything. Blah blah blah. Um, and this will happen as also as a function of neurochemistry. Like when I, when I get off stage, total flow state for me. I'm not neurobiologically capable of being in a good mood after that because all my feel good neurochemistry is gone. So, so the day after a speaking engagement, like I did the Christie's international real estate expo the next day, I was in a horrible mood, bad travel day. I should know better. Right. But, um, so I can't take myself too seriously. It's like, okay, all my feel good neurochemistry is gone. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to take myself too seriously here. So I understand that. But if you adopt a role model mindset, right? Like if your best friend were bringing to you that script, I suck, I'm terrible, I whatever. If your child were bringing it to you that script, I failed, I'm terrible, I suck. How would you respond to that? How would you respond to that person? Well, that's how you need to start shifting your inner script. You know, you're, you're not going to tell them how much they suck, right? You're going to be like, hey, you're not being very nice to yourself here. And you adopt that kind of role model mindset for yourself. Yeah, I like that sort of treating ourselves like the child, the wounded child who needs some support right. and and some some compassion and some empathy and some hey man, I got you. Don't worry. You can fall apart a little, but I got you while you're falling apart and we're going to we're going to change the script here. We're going to give you the comfort you need so that you aren't stuck in this I'm a loser mentality. And by the way, everybody goes through this, right? Everybody goes through this at various times in their life, maybe even on a daily basis some of us I, this I went through this just a few weeks ago. I was I was I don't know why, probably just a who knows a brainstorm or something, or I ate something that I shouldn't have. Anyway, I I, I my neurochemistry got screwed up, and I started really thinking, God, I'm I'm kind of a loser. Like all of a sudden, I was sitting in my condo, and I started listing all the ways in which I'm a loser in my mind, and I felt worse and worse and worse. And I thankfully I was like, wait a minute, I'm gonna stop myself. I was able to catch it while I was doing it, and I said, all right. Maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. But then I started to reality test it. Am I actually a loser? And I thought about, do my friends think I'm a loser? No. Do my family think I'm a loser? No. Do, do my, my boss think I'm a loser? No. They, all these other people think I'm – so maybe they're right and I'm wrong. Okay. Well, what is it all these other people see in me? And I started listing those qualities and some of those – and I, I felt better and I realized – it's the same story. I'm just telling myself one of two different stories. I might, since I get to choose, I might as mm-hmm. well choose the story that serves me. Exactly. That's it. And that's the, that's the responsibility piece. So you talk to a lot of realtors and, you know, you, you almost were, were an agent yourself. And right. right now it's a, it's a, it's a tricky time out there for realtors. Mm-hmm. We, we have lawsuits going on with the national association. We've got, you know, market conditions that are unfavorable for in, in a lot of areas and realtors are, are freaked out a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you telling realtors these days or how are you helping them, you know, pivot a bit so that they're not focused on what they can't control, which are market mm-hmm. conditions and other things, but what they could control? Well, the first thing is you got to get your system aligned with success. So emotional regulation, step one, right? You can do this through box breathing or, or any kind of breath work, really. You engage the parasympathetic nervous system, yep. calm, calm the F down because, you know, nothing got solved in a good way from panic, right? So that's the first thing. Um, the Navy SEALs that I that I train with say slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So slow it down here. Like and, and we we should I'm gonna pause for just a quick second because mm-hmm. Chris just said something very, very important. Look up box breathing. This is a Navy mm-hmm. SEALs technique, and it's very easy. It could not be easier, actually. It's probably the simplest of all the breathing ex, uh, sort of exercises. There's another great one that also activates the parasympathetic, as as does box breathing, called 478, where you mm-hmm. breathe in for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. All of these are designed to activate parasympathetic. For those of you that don't know what that is, we have two nervous systems sort of, uh, you know, uh, I guess... Uh, 
two, two, di- two different nervous system activations. We have one that's sympathetic, which is the fight or flight. I need to, I need to conserve energy so I can survive. And I, you know, and this could be again, not necessarily a survival uh, situation. It's just feels like you're th- being threatened. Um, and then as Chris said, Hey, we don't have access to all of our faculties in that place. So we use something like box breathing or four, seven, eight, or whatever breathing exercise works for you to reduce that activation. So you can get to that wiser part of you. Um, so I apologize. Cause I just wanted to make sure the audience understood that. <laughs> of course. So once, once you're calm, you got to recognize that when are the biggest innovations made, when are millionaires and billionaires made, when are discoveries made? in down economies. Fortunes are made in down economies. And everything can be leveraged to your benefit and your betterment. But you got to get out of how much it sucks. Because when you're in, it sucks, I don't like it. Okay. But how can you alchemize it? What's the alchemical process here? How can you use this? How do you leverage this? Because there is a way. And if I can start changing how somebody relates. And we have a million tools for this kind of stuff, but that has a physiological effect on the brain. Because again, when you're an, I'm suck, uh, this sucks. I hate it. The market's terrible. Excuse, excuse, excuse. That's not going to get us anywhere. Right. Um, Gene Kranz was a flight director at NASA, quick story, um, during the Apollo and Gemini space missions. And I met Gene once many, many years ago now, but, um, there's a scene in the, in the Apollo 13 movie where everybody's bringing Gene, this is wrong and that's wrong. And this is broken. And this is ah, and I, like, everybody's freaking out. And Gene just says, okay, hold on a second, people. What do we got on the spacecraft that's good? And it, in that moment, it's a complete change in orientation and has a physiological effect on everyone's brain. And so, and for, and you can build from there. What are our resources? What do we have? Because now I'm, ex, I'm in an expansive kind of thing. This is where I'm going to sound a little woo. Now I'm in expansion. What do we have? What can, what, what might we be able to do with this? What, instead of contraction, we can't, I don't, I rah, rah, yeah. right? And if you want to grow your business, you need to be in expansion. You cannot grow from contraction or scarcity or, or survival, right? We're talking about thrive and expand. So you can't grow from scarcity anymore than you can lose weight by eating cake. These are just diametrically opposed frequencies. It doesn't work. So you got to change your physiology and your psychology and get your, get yourself pointed in the right direction. The changing your physiology is, is so critical. And we're not necessarily just saying, Hey, get to the gym and lift some weights and get in shape. Yes, you should do that too. But Chris is saying something a bit more specific and faster, which is notice what your physiology is telling you. In other words, if I'm, if depression has a, has a, a syntax to it, if we, if we, you know, depression has a, a posture, right? Depression mm-hmm. has, a, 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 you know, and and so does uh, being happy has a, has a, a physiological sort of, uh, you know, movement to it. Mm-hmm. And so this idea of changing our physiology or asking a different question, like the NASA story you, you said. The, it, it immediately changes everything because it it totally takes our focus from what was to what could be. And mm-hmm. I I'm such a huge fan of this. And and like you said, it, it's it's not even sort of imagining a different future in the NASA example. It's hey, what do we already have that's on this craft that actually is working for us right now? Let's start right. there and figure out how to get these guys home or, or whatever it was. Um, Right. So I mean, I, we can do this right now. I mean, I, I can change let's one do it. word in a set. You want to do one? I'm gonna, we, let's okay, do it. I'll tell you what. All right. So so think of something. Now, you're, you're going to keep everything private. So all okay. I'm going to ask you about is your experience. I'm not going to ask any details. So think of something that you really want, that you have wanted for some time now. And there there is an emotional charge around it. Maybe there's, there's shame or sadness or anger or something about the not having it that has you charged. Yeah, it's really? the sh- it's the no, shame piece. Okay, oh, sorry. So, no, great. Well, I, I yeah, whatever it is. But so yeah. t- tap into that that thing, whether it's an experience or an item or whatever, and 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 think to yourself with the shame present, like touch into that shame and think to yourself, I just want whatever that thing is, and notice how you experience that in your body. Mm-hmm. Now stay connected with that item and think it without the word just. What do you notice as the difference in your experience? Yeah. So when I remove the word just, it seems lighter. 
I would say the the um, the shame uh, feeling uh, diminished significantly, mm-hmm. and I just was able to say, "Oh, I want X. Uh, mm-hmm. I want X," without all the extra baggage associated with it. Right. So what we did there is we produced a physiological effect in your brain. It physically changed the way your brain was working. And I hear a lot of people say different things about this. People say, gosh, it sounds more powerful. It sounds stronger. It sounds, one person said it sounds closer. It feels closer. I'm like, fantastic, right? Because, and and language is really important in this um, because it is how we relate to things. So um, the thing about the word just in particular is number one, it's not true. I just want whatever that thing is. That's not true. I got my friend Gary. Gary Gary's like nine feet tall. He's like, I just want a girl that was single at the time. He says, I just want a girl that's going to be nice to me. I was like, Gary, shut the fuck up. That's not true. You yes, you want a girl that's going to be nice to you and smart and beautiful and tall because he's nine feet tall, right? And like all these things. So just isn't even true, and it discounts the thing that you're focused on. It makes it smaller, right? We use this in manipulation, you know, oh, oh, come on, it'll just take five minutes. Oh, I'm just getting you to violate your boundaries. Like I'm I'm trying to soften it, right? It's very manipulative. But when you get precise language and and aligned language, now you're cooking with gas. Just also uh, presupposes that there's something wrong with me for even like I just want this one thing. It it, it, it right. makes it too, it makes it mm-hmm. way too important, and it, it makes it um, that you can't quite get it right. Instead of saying like you said, switching that for I want X is right. is a, it's lighter. It, it it makes me feel better, and I get more excited. And that again, that shame piece is largely gone. You know, maybe it pokes its head in from time to time, but I'm able to see a brighter future thinking I want X versus God, I just want X. There is a right. huge difference in that response. And the just one kept kept me stuck. The removing just mm-hmm. allowed me to sort of see a future where that was possible. Right. And and this, because it produces that effect in your brain, it creates a different feeling state. Basic neuroscience, feelings drive actions, actions produce results. I, I'll go into a team and and the, what I'm going to look for is I'm going to listen to the way they speak. So I'm going to get an idea of what the culture of the, the organization really is because we have a culture of teamwork. You have no idea what your culture is. Okay. I can hear it in your language. Um, but the if I can remove the fear and the shame, those two things, I'm going to produce wildly different outcomes very quickly. Yeah. You're, you're so right. Fear and shame are the two most, I believe... <laughs> Probably the most debilitating emotions because it's it, shame is there's something wrong with me, which is really hard to fix. That's a big, big uh, thing to, to to try to solve on one's own. You can really just ultimately remove it or expose it. You know, when you talk to, I, I always love with shame too, just telling another human being who you trust and you you know you have a deeper connection with. Hey, this is what I'm ashamed of, and they go, Oh, that's that's what you're ashamed of. You know, and you realize like, Oh, your friends aren't don't react the same way to the things that you think are so terrible. And then they tell you they're terrible things and you're like, that's no big deal either. And so there's different ways to extinguish shame, but, but I love just language a lot of times gets us there. And, um, I'm such a shame, shame in particular. And I love what Brene Brown says about this. The difference between guilt and shame says guilt is I've done bad. Shame is I am bad. And that's a wildly different thing. Wildly different and wildly debilitating to say yes. I am because you can't fix if you think of yourself as broken. Well, there you are, and uh, and and there's there's no really easy way to come back from broken. It, when you start to see yourself as somebody who experiences challenges and is finds ways to overcome, well, that's just a really change in in story. It's a change in sentence structure, and it seems to not be as debilitating. So, uh, boy, I'm so glad we're talking about this. Um, let's talk about this idea of creating innovative, innovative solutions. So yes, we're in a diff- more difficult market. And I know that you're not going to be able to say, well, here's what every real estate agent needs to do in their business right today yeah. to, to pivot. Cause of course that's, that's not, that's not what you do. You help people find that within themselves. So I really want to encourage our audience to consider, you know, working with Chris, because imagine if you had all of these answers inside of you, as Chris, uh, you know, says, and all you have to do is eliminate the 
blocks to get there. Um, but how does somebody access innovative solutions or, or what does it take to get to a place, you know, as you said, fortunes are made in these disruptive times? Yeah, I mean, I'm all about tools. Like, our, our while all of this can be um, very theoretical and and you know scientifically accurate, you know, you got to put this into play. So I'll give you one of my one of the tools that I use quite a bit, and it's it's a lot of fun. I call it Banana World. You can call it whatever you want, but it is the the rules of the game are pretty simple. It is it is a world of the fantastic, the absurd, the ridiculous. And there really are no no rules in like even the, the the laws of gravity don't necessarily exist if you don't want them to, and you have a outcome that you're trying to achieve. And the and the the game is to say one thing that you would never actually do. It's not a plausible solution. It's it's a I'm looking for a ridiculous solution on if you did that, then that outcome would come to fruition. So an example of this, I was working with a client a number of years ago. She was really stuck, like really stuck, you know, stuck at work, stuck at home, stuck, stuck, stuck. And I said, okay, let's, let's get her unstuck. We'll go to banana world. I said, what, what is one thing you could do? Nothing you would ever actually do, but one thing you could do that if you did it, you would no longer be stuck like this. And she fumbled around for a second. She said, well, I could fake my death and move to Costa Rica. Yep. That would do it if you faced your desk and moved to Costa Rica. What else? She said. Uh, she said something that I probably should repeat on the air. So I'm just gonna let that. Was <laughs> but we we just ridiculous idea after ridiculous idea. Now here's the science behind it. What we're doing is we've gone out of a world of all the reasons things can't work into a world of exploration of how things can work. Again, now this is the aligned way of thinking. We're also driving a massive amount of neurochemistry. Like there's a lot of dopamine going on because we're laughing our asses off because the, the, the solutions are beyond ridiculous. But the more you do this, right? You spend a little time in banana world. What else and what else and what else? And you say, oh, and we can do this and we can do that and all these things. These viable elements of solutions start to slip in. Yeah. And before you know it, you actually have an answer to the problem. Or maybe it's just you have to take, you know, you end up taking the most extreme or one of the really extreme, never going to happen ideas. And there's a little kernel of like, no, there's something in there that we could mm -hmm. actually do. We, we do this in our brainstorming sessions here at work. We, we have a, a rule that says you're not allowed to shit on anyone's idea because mm -hmm. just let it float out there. Even if it's like, that's the dumbest idea, just let it go because somebody might go, Hey, that won't work, but I got it. I got something else that's right, uh, right mm -hmm. next to that. Or I can take a part of that and merge it with this other thing and we can make that work. So, so you're so right. This idea of looking for solutions, it, even fantastical, non-realistic solutions oh. oftentimes orient our brain to actually find a real solution along the way. Yeah. In, when working with a team and I'll get creative, like, you know what I'm thinking right now, if I had a team in front of me right now, I would do something like, okay, come up with a ridiculous solution or statement. And then the next person has to come up, has, has to like build on that, like make it more ridiculous. How would you, how would you add to the stupidity of this? Right. And just, and people start working together. They start getting along. We start having fun, right? Feelings drive actions, right? Feelings drive actions, actions produce results. So what do I need to be feeling here? What does this team need to be experiencing to get the results that they're looking for? How do I, how do I put that into play to make that happen? I love it. Tell us about your coaching programs. You know, tell us about sort of what people could expect, uh, the different types of services you offer and, you know, how our audience maybe could consider working with you. Yeah, we, we work with teams. We do uh, group engagements. We have one-on-one uh, -on -one engagements. It just depends on what's the best fit for the client, what's going to get them there the fastest. Um, the the groups are wildly successful and beyond my my wildest dreams, actually. When I, I put it out there going, I don't know, let's see what happens. And I, I'm a little surprised by my surprise. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about one of our uh, and, and, and it doesn't matter what we're working on, right? It could be that we have a get unstuck program. If you're stuck at work, you're stuck at home, you're stuck at whatever. Um, but we have a client right now that has a digital marketing company and she came to us because she, and she came into the group and there's uh, six in that group and she wanted to support in growing the business and making things better. Right. Well, she, 
she got divorced through the process. Uh, 20, I think the marriage was 26 years to, to a clinical narcissist. I know we throw that word Oof. around quite a bit, but it's a rough. clinical, clinical narcissist. Oof. Um, so she got out of the, she got, she got the divorce signed, sealed and delivered. She got the house. She got the house refinanced. She, she moved 13 times during this process. So all of this was, you know, happening while that was going on. We got her off of her anti-anxiety and anti-depression anti medication. She dropped 45 pounds. Uh, she went from two dogs to three, cause that's important when you have a dog. Uh, and we tripled her business. Wow. This happened in 14 months. Wow. Like so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. We're talking about quantum leaps in changing. I had another client said we doubled her revenues, we eliminated her stress, and we saved her marriage. That took four months. Wow. Yeah. As as you were, as you as you as you've been talking, and and we've been doing, and we even did an exercise earlier. I I started realizing this idea of asking questions is really an underutilized tool. And this is why, and I also know that it, oftentimes we cannot solve our own issues. Sometimes we can, mm -hmm. most of the time we can't. And it sometimes just takes a third party, somebody who knows how to elicit this kind of response to literally be the person that's like, hey, I'm gonna walk you through a process do you just you just follow along, and, and then by the end of that process, or however many times you need you need to see them, um, the result just happens. But I think we we do ourselves a bit of a disservice thinking it's all self help. I could just help myself, help myself. Well, the best my best thinking got me into this mess, right? So probably I could use a third party to come in and say, just like I wouldn't look. They, it's that old expression. Uh, an attorney who represents himself has a fool for a client, right? Right. It's right. it's a brilliant thing, and attorneys know this, and they don't even joke about it. They're like, "No, we I literally won't represent myself." Doctors say the same thing. You know, a doctor who treats mm -hmm. himself has a fool for a patient. So this idea of having a third party really helps because inside of us, right, are all of these old patterns and and, and challenges mm -hmm. and and wounds and things that happened to us or, or you know, for whatever reason, they're stuck in there and we don't even know that they're roadblocks, so we don't know how to get around them. H hiring somebody like you allows you to be able to see the things that maybe I'm even blind to. Yeah, that's, I mean, we are the mirror, you know, that that's essentially what we, we are a mirror to show you what you can't see. Um, you know, I tell people this is really tricky work because, you know, to your point, it's it's like it's like driving the car that you're working on because you're you're trying to hack your internal belief system that's been running since you were six years old and, and you're 90 something percent unconscious of how it works. Right. So you're trying to hack the system with the system. Right. So you're trying to hack itself. It's very tricky work. And so um, but it happens crazy fast. You know, clients generally don't work with us for more than a year. Wow. It's, yeah, we we move quickly. That's the, the two things we don't do is quit and fail. And uh, and I tell people if I can't get this done in way less time, I suck at my job. So <laughs> I love that. Well, for anyone listening, if you are feeling and look, it's not if you are feeling stuck. Think about where you currently feel stuck. And I'll give you a, a little suggestion, not Chris and suggestion, but our audience a suggestion. Think about reality, right? So a lot of this has to do with accepting reality as it is, what they call radical acceptance. The world is how it is. I don't have to like it, but I should accept it. And then the things, things I don't like, maybe I can you know, make some changes, right? Or I can affect change. Um, but if we are stuck in fighting against reality, the market sucks, the inventory sucks. Yes, all of those things are true. And getting upset about it doesn't change reality one bit. <laughs> it literally just reinforces your crappy feelings. And so there's not to say that you shouldn't know what's going on. Of course you should, but you should realize what are you saying to yourselves? Are you focusing on the stuckness? Because focusing on the stuckness is very unlikely to lead to any breakthroughs and really changing that narrative and saying, okay, yes, here are these market conditions. I accept that that's what's happening. And I know there's other people really succeeding right now. And I'm mm -hmm. curious on maybe what they're doing. And I'm curious on if I started thinking about this as an opportune time to grow my business, well, what might I start doing if I actually thought this was like the best possible time to be in real estate? And maybe it is the best possible time to be in real estate. Think about that, everyone who's listening. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not so bad right now because we just feel that we're in the moment. 
uh, of, of, of what it feels like to not be in a great time. What if, if Chris is right? What if there's innovation that's going to completely change our industry and you could be part of that by not focusing on what you can't control, which is reality, right? Reality is. Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm really, uh, oh, I wanted to ask one last question to you, Chris, because I think mm-hmm. this is something I want to get your per- perspective. You talk about, you know, all of, you know, in these down markets, in these sort of depressive times that innovation disruption happens, people can make fortunes. Um, I think there's a piece to this about un- learning how to tolerate discomfort as well. This idea of m- realizing, so yes, right now doesn't always feel super great in the real estate market and, and not, but, but, and, and I'm going to continue to, to try to do my best to move forward. And I was just curious to get your thoughts about learning how to tolerate, you know, we, we, we we're so lucky in this country because we have so much adva- so much advantage. Uh, it's it's easy to be comfortable. It's easy to get have things come our way. I mean, we can order dinner and have it you know arrive in thirty minutes, or really order anything and have it arrive in an hour. So this idea of you know we expect things to happen right away. We don't like discomfort, um, but. I think the ability to tolerate discomfort builds resiliency, and so when these mar- these these troubled times do happen, you're like, I, I know how to handle this. Like, I I've, I can deal with this. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on tolerating discomfort. Yeah, tolerating discomfort. I mean, comfort in and of itself is a function of repetition. You can get real comfortable in a horrific situation, and you can normalize it over time. It'll just change your baseline, right? So humans are just functionally programmable in that way. So, so the 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 lack of tolerance comes is is more about change, not mm-hmm. so much about how how awful something is. Um, so the I would say that the the big opportunity, and I've said this before to clients many times, if you want bigger success, get bigger problems. Like because struggle and progress are in relationship. You don't get progress without the struggle, right? The the arrow doesn't fly if the bow doesn't flex and strain, right? So, so that's the opportunity. And as as my friends in the military say, God love them, embrace the suck, right? It's like yes, this sucks. Well, in order to get where we want, we need the suck. So yes, embrace the suck. Yeah, and again, radical acceptance. It's okay that this sucks. I will. I will. I can get through it. And, and if I need help to get through it, I will reach out for help to get through it. But this idea of reality just is it, it, military. It's all about reality. They can't live in, 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 in fantasy, right? Everything is so important and critical. They have to embrace the suck because they're defending, you know, or, or attacking or whatever they're doing to protect us. Um, they have to be willing to put themselves in extremely uncomfortable situations. And you know what? It's so funny when, when these uh, men and women who serve our country, and, and other countries, of course, too, you know, armies all over the world. Um, when they come, when they leave service, I'm always like, you are, I, most of these guys, you know, again, there's trauma and there's things that they may have to deal with, but their resiliency is incredible because they already know what it's like to tolerate discomfort. They're like, oh, I just got to work hard. I already know how to do that. I was, I was in Afghanistan or I was in Iraq or I was, you know, whatever the discomforting situation was, or I saw people die or whatever it may be. This idea of, like you said, get big, I love this, get bigger problems too. It's like, you have to almost dream bigger and be willing to fail a little bit bigger as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, fail meaning just not getting the result that you want, but thinking like, well, what happens if I were to go after this big giant thing? Well, maybe it wouldn't happen, but I'd sure sure learn a lot. And then I could adjust and maybe make additional changes for the future. But I have to be willing to step into the fire a little bit from time to time and just tolerate and say, I'm going to survive. I can survive this. Chris, I, I think this is a great place to to wrap. I want to tell everybody to please, you know, look, if you liked what Chris said, and I certainly did, and I hope that this resonated with everybody. In fact, I just, I know that it did. So I want you to reach out to Chris and consider working with him, him whether you're on a team, you're an individual, maybe you're a business owner, um, or, or you own a brokerage or, or whatever. You know, you're just feeling there's a certain part of your life that you could use some help getting past uh, and reach out to Chris. You know, the best way to do that, go to status flow.net, uh, statusflow.net. And also, um, there's all sorts of places you can go on there to learn more about Chris and his services and subscribe to the mindfuck podcast. Chris talks about all of these kinds of things. Again, science based sort of, uh, you know, personal technology to get beyond some of our, our challenges. So go to, uh, to oh, real quickly, Chris, give us a plug for mindfuck. What do you do on the show? 
Well, we're bending reality right there in a matter of minutes. Instead of it was my my CMO said and who named it by the way. I resisted him for a month and I was like, all right, you win. Um, <laughs> but he he um he he was the one that said, hey, why why are we doing the podcast the way it is? So was, why don't you just start consulting and coaching people? Like why don't you just start running processes on people? And so we tried it the first one. It was incredible. Um, Allison had a a transform a sustainable transformation in about 12 minutes. Um, wow. there's, there's a moment you can actually hear her. You can hear the audio where, where it just takes her breath away. And I'm like, what? Yeah, we're doing this. And so we've had some incredible stories. Uh, the one I mentioned earlier about the digital marketing company, she's on there. Um, and there, there are many like that where these aha moments, and then we follow up with them, you know, about six months down the road, check in and be like, Hey, where are you? And they're like, my life has changed. And it's, it's incredible. So yeah, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple mind. Fuck. Um, thank you for, for, for that. Cause I, I love that. And I, I don't invite people to be on that. I dare them. I mean, really, I dare you to be on my podcast. Cause it's wicked deep. Like we go into it. The same with work with me. I don't, I don't invite people to work with us. I dare them. <laughs> I dare you to work with me. <laughs> well, it, it should, it, it should be a look. I, I found that in life, pretty much everything that's worthwhile is a little scary and requires some courage. And, you know, those are the things that where you, where I think fulfillment can lay, but you gotta be willing to be uncomfortable, right? You gotta be willing to, to, to be be vulnerable and to try something hard because it's the only way that we, we learn and get better. So if you want to try, and by the way, if you want some, um, you know, some encouragement, listen to mindfuck because just by listening to someone else's transformation, look, one person's work is every person's work. And you may just, in fact, start to change just by listening to mindfuck. So please check it out. Listen to the the results Chris is getting determined if that would work for you, whether you're on the show or you hire Chris as a, as a coach, but please do check it out. Mindfuck is the podcast and status flow is the website statusflow.net where you can learn all about Chris. We have a, a landing page on statusflow.net as well that we will be sending out for just for our listeners. If you're interested in working with Chris directly. So on behalf of our audience, Chris, thank you so much. Really appreciate all your time and your wisdom today. It was super helpful. This is right up my alley. I love all the things that you talked about and uh, maybe we'll, we'll love to have you back on the show. And also on behalf of Chris and myself, we want to thank the audience for sticking around to the end. Check out Chris's uh, website, statusflow.net. Subscribe to Mindfuck. And uh, Chris, thank you once again. I want to ask everybody before you sign off, uh, guys, just do two things. For, actually, we'll just do one thing today. Just tell a friend about this episode. Tell one other real estate state agent that is struggling right now. And guess what? Pretty much all of them are. So send them a link to this episode. That would help us out as well. So Chris, thank you so much. We will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.